2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10. We have a really an incredible privilege made made more real to me because of the occasion this week of bringing ourselves under God's word this morning. Um, as you know, in light of the decision of the Supreme Court on Friday to affirm and legalize homosexual unions as marriage. Uh, to come under God's word this morning is really a, a particular privilege. It's a particular need. And before I reference the events Friday, I, I want to read something that was written a couple of thousand years before Friday. Just for context, I'm going to read just the first couple of verses of chapter 3. We're going to focus more on verse 10 and following and this message is not going to be a, a typical exegetical message where we, we, we really focus exclusively on the passage. We're going to be pulling in other sections of Scripture as well. But this passage does provide a, a wonderful pattern for us to follow this morning. So just for context, chapter 3, verse 1, and then we'll skip down to verse 10. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Let's jump down to verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help this morning, Lord. You know that my 
My heart is full of more things to say than can possibly said, be said in the time that I have. And so I just ask for your grace, for your help, for your favor, for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me make a couple of comments on this passage. I, I wanted to read uh, that length of passage just because I thought it was, it was so relevant. Every section of it seems to bring a different hope, a different promise, a different clarity. But we're going to focus more on uh, verses 10 through 16 as a, a pattern. I just want you to notice something in, in this scripture. You notice that Paul talks about uh, his circumstances and his culture, and then he transitions to the conviction he wants Timothy to have. You notice that pattern? He, he talks about his past and his history as a way of describing uh, the culture in which he lived, the world in which he lived, was a world in which gospel allegiance and the word was not approved, it was opposed. That was the world in which he lived. And Paul says that that's not only the case for him, but that would be the case for everyone who seeks to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. Verse 12, that they will all be persecuted, that it will be the case in culture that evil people and imposters, those claiming to do good while actually doing harm, will go on from bad to worse. They'll deceive others. They'll be personally deceived. And then he transitions to the conviction. What should Timothy do in that kind of culture facing that kind of circumstance? What should he do? What, what should Timothy's conviction be? Continue, he says in verse 14, in what you have learned. And remember the scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. Those scriptures which center on the person and work of Jesus Christ and bring reconciliation to God. And then he makes this very clear. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be equipped. Preach the word, Timothy, in season and out of season. This is the pattern of this passage. Here, here's, here's the culture, opposition to God's word and gospel ministry, deceiving and being deceived, evil going from bad to worse, and here's our conviction. Trust the word, Timothy. <coughs> Timothy's a, a pastor, a preacher, so obviously he has a particular responsibility, but by implication, the church should receive his teaching, receive this priority. Here, here's the culture, and here's the call. Trust the word. Trust the word, Timothy. Look to the word. In the face of an evil culture, we must trust the word. In the face of a dark world, we must trust the word. That's what Paul's advice to Timothy is. That's the pattern of this passage. And I thought it was a, a helpful passage because it really fits quite nicely into the need that we have this morning. I want to frame this message, which again, won't look extensively at this passage alone, really around that same pattern. I'm, I'm going to try to answer two questions. What has changed and what has not changed? What has changed and what has not changed? In a similar way that Paul speaks of culture and his changing circumstances from one city to the next, and what has not changed. Well, let's look at first what has changed. Now, in one sense, it's a trick question. If we, read the, if we read the passage, that's a trick question, isn't it? Because if you read what's happened to Paul, uh, we could easily say, well, well nothing really has changed very much. Uh, nothing much has changed. The culture today, in some ways, actually doesn't look as bad as the culture did back then. Certainly, it fits in with Paul's description where Christian morals and biblical values are not approved or applauded. They are opposed in the culture. So in one sense, we could say nothing's changed. But I think just to be realistic, certainly in our lifetime, there has been a significant shift. And certainly Friday marked a monumental change representing years of work on behalf of those working for that change in our country. So what has changed? If we want to look more generationally and not in the broad sweep of history, what has changed? Well, as most, if not all of you would be aware, the Supreme Court declared on Friday their interpretation that the Constitution of the United States grants same-sex couples the right to be recognized as married in the same way 
that a heterosexual couple is married in the eyes of the law. Implicit, or we might even say explicit, in this ruling is the federal endorsement of homosexual marriage since it now receives a number of federal benefits under law historically only available to heterosexual couples. So that's changed. That is a significant change. States and state institutions or state officials cannot now legally ban or refuse to recognize a homosexual union in the same way that they would a heterosexual marriage. That represents an incredible challenge for state employees involved in things like marriage ceremonies. Society's acceptance of homosexual marriage has also shifted significantly. This is not simply a change in the law. It also represents a change in society as well. Many more people in favor of homosexual marriage now than would have been true not even very many years ago. That's a change. That's changed. It's also true that the opposition to same-sex marriage, people that would disagree with same-sex marriage on convictional grounds, is now viewed in many quarters as bigotry on par with racism. The conviction that such a union is wrong is viewed as antiquated at best and dangerous or wrong at worst. Uh, certainly, such a biblical con conviction is considered worthy of active opposition by certain proponents of homosexual marriage. Legal precedents have been set which appear to be eroding the ability of some Christians to legally object to some level of participation in a same-sex wedding. Christian convictions have transitioned from mainstream to unusual to dangerous to outrageous to immoral, largely in the case of the last couple of decades. Quite a profound change. Perhaps the most sad, many professing Christians and Christian teachers are choosing to abdicate the truth of God's word rather than stand firm in the face of these cultural changes. I don't doubt at all that their intentions are sincere and genuine, that their desire to reach out and love those in a homosexual lifestyle is godly and commendable. However, in the end, the fact is that many professing Christians and Christian teachers and churches are choosing to believe that the Bible does not say what it says and to disagree with church history in unbroken interpretation of God's word on this issue. Christians in subsequent generations will likely face a culture not approving or even accepting of, but rather in opposition, even anger, even outrage at these biblical convictions. The other thing that may have changed is you may be experiencing a change. Maybe even Friday. Maybe you were doing fine, happy-go-lucky, up till Thursday, and you've noticed since Friday a change in your emotions. There may be some of us who are uh, confused, not sure what to think. Uh, maybe it's the case that this shouldn't be such a big deal. Maybe it's true that the Bible uh, is just misinterpreted or wrong, or, or maybe we just shouldn't talk about this very much, or maybe it's the case that um, this is not something that we need to disagree about. It's just a disputable matter. We can agree to disagree. We can live and let live. Or maybe you are firm in your convictions and in your understanding of God's Word, and you're just fearful. You're fearful for your kids, or you're fearful for the future, or you're fearful for change, or you don't like the idea that the country is now talking differently about marriage than it did when you grew up. That, that would be a totally understandable reaction. That may have changed. You maybe experience a, a level of anxiety or fear or confusion or maybe anger that you weren't experiencing Thursday. That, that may have changed. Our context has changed. It would be untrue to act otherwise. Our context has changed. Now, not in the broad sweep of history, no, but in our immediate lifetime, some things have changed. They have changed significantly. They actually reflect in a closer way 
Paul's experience when he describes his ministry of the gospel as being opposed, maligned, mistreated, disliked, misunderstood. Our culture, in some small way, not to the degree that Paul experienced, but in some small way, but significant in our lifetime, now reflects in a greater way his experience of his culture as he held firm his convictions as God's word. So like Paul, we now are experiencing a world that does not understand or certainly agree with the convictions of Scripture and is willing to oppose those convictions as dangerous. So, like Paul, in the midst of changing circumstances, what has changed, we need to look to what has not changed. What has not changed? What is exactly the same as it was on Thursday afternoon? What has not changed? God has not changed. And God's word has not changed. Saturday did not introduce a new Bible. The same Bible lays open before us. The same words lay open before us. And that is marvelous good news to us. That is wondrously good news because in the midst of a lot of change, it's very helpful to have something that remains the same. My, my friends and my, my family know I am, I mean, terrible is, a, is not a, a strong enough word in terms of my um, directional ability. I, I am capable of returning to the same location again and again and again only to have the next time get lost on my way to that location. It is a profound weakness in my, the other day I was driving to a friend's house, I've been to his house countless times, but with all of the rain, uh, there's more trees. There's more trees now. And I was, I was driving down the road and I'm driving and all of a sudden, I, I mean, I've been, I've, I've gone countless times and here I'm driving and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that was, that was his street. I just totally, it passed his, it's, this is not difficult directions, it's like one left turn, very simple. I just rolled right past it, and I had to go up and turn around, you turn, I thought, I can't believe it, I can't believe I didn't see, well, what happened? Well, something minor changed, and if you're like me, I need clear, clear directions, I need help. I typically can't go anywhere without my phone barking at me to tell me which, turn left, turn around, turn right. Sometimes you would think that the phones would begin to be sarcastic. I'm grateful they're not moral creatures. <laughs> what is wrong with you, you crazy person? Turn around. How many times do I have to say it? Turn left for crying out loud. Turn the right way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm grateful they don't have that version uh, in Siri. <laughs> sarcastic Siri would have a lot of fun when I'm driving. Um, <laughs> thankfully, she's just very gracious. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. <laughs> It's remarkable. Uh, anyway, uh, you, need, you need help sometimes in the midst of changing circumstances and left to ourselves, we are often weak to know the right way to go. Let's just imagine something for a moment. Imagine that God was who he is, that everything according to history had happened the way it did. Jesus came, all that's in place. God created the world. But he had chosen not to give us the Bible. What would you do right now? Everything objectively still the same. God has the same expectations. God's the same God. Salvation is still available in Jesus Christ. What he considers right and wrong is still absolutely unchanged, but no Bible. What would we do in a moment where everything's changed? How would we know what to do? How would we know what this God who is in charge, how he expects us to live and to act? We would be lost. We would have nothing. We have no way of knowing how we're supposed to respond to him. We'd be guessing in the dark. Culture would rise and fall. We would roll right past the right direction with, with no sense of clarity. And yet a gracious God has revealed himself to us. That's why this is incredibly good news. God was under no obligation to write a book. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. He could have had every human being standing before him on that final day, have all the same expectations, and yet not have given him such clear directions. 
So what do we do in the midst of a changing culture? We trust God's word. I want to point out three aspects. I, I could have talked about countless aspects, but three aspects of the doctrine of Scripture that we should look to as we trust God's word. First, the authority of God's word. The authority of God's word. Look down there at verse 16 in your Bibles. You notice it says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Breathed out by God. Wonderful, wonderful phrase. What that means is every, every portion of Scripture, every word of Scripture, God himself uh, has given to us as his direct word to us. Yes, the scriptures were written by men. Uh, yes, God ultimately inspired them through men's vocabulary, women's vocabulary. And yet the reality is this word is God's word. They are breathed out by God. What that means is they are absolute and unappealable and unassailable in their authority. God has spoken. God has declared. God has revealed. This is not God's suggestion. These words are not written by men such that God wishes they had been written a different way. No, they are breathed out by God. What amazing words are written right here in 2 Timothy. Breathed out by God. And that is remarkable good news. Because if you know the Bible well, you know that its central message, its central command is believe in the salvation I have provided for you, that sinful people can come into a relationship with a holy God. And therefore, since this word is God's word, we can claim every truth of the scripture as having absolute validity and authority and unassailable truth. It's good for us that the Bible is our authority and that it comes with the authority of God endorsed by God every word we want that to be true it's dreadful to be in a world where you don't know who is in charge especially if there is someone in charge and he hasn't told you it's wonderful to be in a place where there is someone in charge and he has made very very clear what that means to us and surprisingly what that means more than anything is to believe in his salvation scripture is breathed out by god this is a good good thing it's a good thing because uh, though there are parts of the Bible that confront our pride and even confront our limited capacity to understand, the Bible also communicates things that we love hearing and we love to understand. And make no mistake, if you choose to eliminate the authority of the Bible, you eliminate the authority of the promises of the Bible. A writer that I love, Kevin DeYoung, says this very well, relevant for our situation this week. Any Christian who really believes the Bible must believe all of the Bible. You can't applaud what Jesus says about loving your neighbor from Leviticus 19 if Leviticus 18 and 20 are throwaway chapters. He references those two because those are two chapters that reference the topic of homosexuality as being a forbidden relationship by God. You can't unpack the good news of Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation, if Romans 1, they pursued desires contrary to nature, is overstuffed with cultural baggage. You can't marvel at the goodness of God's creation if there is no good design in how he created things. Either the Bible is God's word, or we are sufficiently God-like to determine which words stay and which words go. That's a truth we need to hear this morning. That's an unchanging truth that we need to hear, and particularly if, if, you're, if you're tempted, as, as many could be, to wonder, well, isn't this just an issue that we should just agree with the culture and not offend anybody? Well, there are some issues that, that are not clear in the Bible that God has not spoken specifically about that are irrelevant to the Christian faith and obeying God. However, this is not one of them. 
God's word has spoken very clearly. Kevin Young goes on to quote, uh, and actually a person who doesn't believe in biblical authority in this issue is actually a helpful quote. Let me, let me read that. The cultural breezes are blowing against us, DeYoung says. The worldly winds are stiff in our faces, but the hard parts of the Bible are no less true for being unpopular. The Bible says what it says, so let us be honest enough to say whether we think that the Bible, what the Bible says is right or wrong. Let me read that again. Let us be honest enough to say, to say whether we think that the Bible, what the Bible says is right or wrong. D.R. made McCulloch a decorated church historian and gay man who left the church over the issue of homosexuality has stated the issue with refreshing candor. Listen, listen to this quote by McCulloch. This is an issue of biblical authority. Despite much well-intentioned theological fancy footwork to the contrary, it is difficult to see the Bible as expressing anything else but disapproval of homosexual activity let alone having any conception of homosexual identity. The only alternatives are either to cleave to patterns of life and assumptions set out in the Bible, or say that in this, as much else, the Bible is simply wrong. He appreciates the candor of that homosexual man who chose to leave the church because he saw this clearly. Others that are similar to that man, I have read say the same thing. It's actually helpfully uh, uh, honest and straightforward. You can choose to say, I don't believe in the authority of the Bible, and I've chosen to instead create my own morality. That's a choice that God has allowed you to make. It's not a godly choice. It will ultimately be judged, but you are able to make that choice. But you cannot choose to say, I believe in the authority of the Bible, but I don't believe in the authority of this part of the Bible. That's the point he's making. And the point I'm making is, the authority of the Bible is incredibly good. It's incredibly good for us to have clear boundary lines, some of which we understand, some of which we don't, but boundary lines set for us in pleasant places by a good God who gave us an incredible salvation, a Bible that is able to make us wise for salvation, as Paul says to Timothy, is not an authority that we should throw off. Who wouldn't want the authority of a God who chooses to reconcile sinners to a holy God and grant them eternal life? Who wouldn't want that God to be their king and their authority? That's the point of the Bible. The authority of the Bible is an unchanging truth that is very good good for Christians to remember in a time of changing culture. To uphold the Bible as our authority is incredibly reassuring when we remember that its central command is to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, who came to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. No wonder Paul points Timothy to the Bible in the midst of changing culture. The authority of the Bible, one unchanging truth. Second unchanging truth, the clarity of God's word. The clarity. If you've read um, systematic theologies that talk about Christian doctrine, uh, these are two central aspects of the doctrine of Scripture that theologians have drawn out of teaching on Scripture uh, for centuries now. The Bible is God's authoritative word. It's also clear. It doesn't mean that there's no parts of the Bible that are harder to understand. It means that it's essential issues. It's essential matters, matters that pertain to eternal life and following God. Everything we need to know is clear in the Bible. It is not confusing. God does not speak in undiscernible riddles. He has spoken clearly in his word. And we need to remember the clarity of the Bible in a moment of shifting culture. We need that. The Bible is incredibly clear on all essential matters of faith and life. Let me just run through a number of relevant ways in which the Bible is clear. I think they're relevant to this week, and you'll see why. I could have hit any number of topics where the Bible is very clear, uh, but let me just hit these 10. I think you'll see their relevance. Some, some clear points about each of these are made. You, you could look at countless verses that would support the clarity of the Bible in each of these points. All human beings are made in the image of God incredibly clear, not vague in the Bible. Which means in this culture, no person can think I'm better than you and each person can say to another, I think you have more value and dignity than you can possibly imagine. Incredible implications to that first truth, relevant 
for today's culture. Another point at which the Bible is incredibly clear, all humans are accountable to God for their lives. Ecclesiastes is just one of countless verses we could reference. God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Incredibly clear, not vague, not vague. That is not a vague point. All humans are accountable to God for their lives. The issue of homosexuality, like every issue, is not an issue of preference or subjective human determination, but ultimately a decision of God's perspective of right and wrong. If God says something is wrong, it is wrong. If God says something is right, it is right. If God chooses not to speak on something, then we can be clear not to speak on something with definitive moral judgment. But where God says something is right or wrong, that is the starting point for every discussion for a Christian and the ending point for every discussion for a Christian. A third point in the Bible, incredibly clear, not vague. God is not vague in this third point. God created marriage as a lifelong union between one man and one woman. Incredibly clear. We read quickly from Genesis chapter 2, very familiar passage. The Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him, I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs, and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Very clear, not vague, not vague, which is so kind of the Lord, isn't it? Isn't it kind of the Lord? If you can imagine a little child whose parents always gave them confusing directions, that would be what it would be like if God wasn't clear on the most important parts of our existence and our identity? Go clean your room, but don't clean your room. Go upstairs, but go downstairs. Always make your bed, but sometimes don't. <laughs> That's not the way God is. He's incredibly clear because he's such a good father. The biblical text is full, full of verses and even an entire book of the Bible that commends the biblical vision of the union of a man and a woman as God's design, and listen, not a single positive reference to a sexual union between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. Perhaps most important, Ephesians 5 indicates that God's intention was for men and women equally in the image of God, equal in value and dignity, but distinct distinct from each other in their gendered existence, distinct, to in that distinction display in some mysterious way the union between Christ and his church. Obviously, that picture completely breaks down if the gendered sameness of man to man, woman to woman, obliterate God's brilliant design of these two distinct entities coming together. Let's walk through a few more very, very clear, very clear sections in Scripture. Four, all forms of sexual union outside of the marital relationship of man and woman are outside of the marital relationship of man and woman are sinful. Sexual sin is not a matter of a disputable matter of conscience. Very unhelpful way that some, some teachers right now are describing this. This is just a disputable matter of conscience. Not true. There are disputable matters of conscience. Yes. 
Corinthians, should they eat meat or not eat meat in that culture where meat was sacrificed to idols? Okay, difficult matter of conscience. This is not one of them. Very, very clear. Six, unrepentant sin will lead to God's eternal judgment. Let me read a couple of verses that make those three points abundantly clear. Paul in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I love how that verse, in the same time, Paul, he, he, he makes clear that such sins followed in unrepentance, chosen without change, indicate not that a person is comfortable with grace, but that they are headed towards God's judgment. At the same time, he humbles the Christians in Corinth by reminding them, you are no better than those who are currently doing these things. Don't be proud as though you're better than them. Remember with gratefulness that God saved you from those ways of life. He forgave you for those ways of life, and he set you apart unto holiness. Neither pride nor permissiveness is allowable on the issue of sexuality in the Bible. Very, very appropriate, relevant passage, perhaps the most relevant in Romans chapter 1. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity for the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die, listen, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. How relevant is that last phrase to this week? It's incredibly clear. That passage is incredibly clear on this topic. It's not vague. God has not given us vague teaching, and I'm amazed at his graciousness in that. You could make the case that even what is present in the Old Testament was sufficient to make this point clear. But in the kindness of God, he looks across the centuries, he sees this as a debatable topic, and so he includes these unmistakably clear sections in his word so that his church can know exactly where to go, where to turn, what not to do. Incredible kindness of the Lord and the reason why we should trust in his clear word. One point here that is made frequently online and by people looking to um, dismiss the Bible's teaching on this topic, uh, this should be um, obvious, but it sounds persuasive when people say it. Uh, the presence of argument does not indicate a lack of clarity in the Bible. Uh, some people will say things like, well, people are arguing about that, so therefore uh, it's, it's really disputable. But if that were true, then here's some of the other doctrines of Scripture we would have to dismiss. The Incarnation, the Trinity, the death of Christ, the doctrine of hell, and the need of Christ for salvation. So, the idea that because somebody out there says, that isn't what it means, and I'm going to tell you why. Therefore, it must not mean that. Uh, that's an incredibly illogical and unhelpful statement for anybody to make. And certainly any Christian should be terrified to make that statement. Because if you make that statement, then you don't, you don't have anything else in your Bible. If a smart person disagreeing with the Bible means the Bible isn't true, then throw out the Bible. 
Simply because someone argues against clarity doesn't mean it's not clear. We, we know this through human existence. People are capable of, of arguing incredibly clear things with great passion. The presence of argument doesn't reveal a lack of clarity in the Bible so much as does the stubbornness of sin and a determination to see things our own way. Other very, very clear points in the Bible. All people are offered forgiveness through Jesus Christ. All people, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. All people, all people, all people of all types of sexual sin are offered forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Adulterers and fornicators and homosexuals and lesbians, they're offered forgiveness if they will come and repent, just like any of us who are Christians have. We are bowed on knee and say, God, you're in charge. I have sinned against you. I don't understand all of your rules and why you've given them, but you're God, and so you get to make them, and so I repent for having disobeyed you, and I receive the forgiveness provided through Jesus Christ. All people, and that is the the most important message of the church and the most important message and focus of every Christian. Obviously, there are other things that need to be said and we're saying them this morning, but that is the most important message. Nothing is more important than that message. Eight, forgiven Christians must not be arrogant or self-righteous toward anyone. Self-righteousness is thinking I am better than someone else or less in need of salvation than someone else. Now be careful. Self-righteousness is not agreeing with God's definition of sin. That is not being self-righteous. That is being biblical. It is translating God's definition of sin into occasion of pride for me rather than humility. The saved person is not that man or woman who declares himself to be better than others but rather the person who worships a savior who died in his or her place for his or her sins and extends the same offer of repentance and forgiveness to others. I pray that God brings those who struggle with same-sex attraction to our church, that they repent of their sins, that their continued struggle is a normal part of us walking together in the Lord and that we help them as they help us to follow Jesus with faithfulness. I pray that is the case. We are not looking to hunker down and find some place in the desert we can worship only with those who struggle in exactly the same ways we do. No, not at all, not at all. Because we want to offer forgiveness and salvation to anybody who will repent of their sins and turn toward Jesus. Is that going to be uncomfortable? Absolutely. But it will be marvelous display of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has saved us. Nine, true love doesn't lie or smother the truth. I read something yesterday online, somebody probably in response to what took place that said something like, all we need is unconditional love. Now, I agree with that, but you can see what is smuggled into that, can't you? Yes, we need unconditional love. I, I completely agree. But to love someone truly is to tell them the truth. It is not loving to lie to someone or to allow them indefinitely to exist in a lie that is catastrophic for their eternity. That's not loving. No definition of love that put that into practice in a practical way would be upheld. Pick your analogy. Child falling off a cliff, person with cancer, person in a burning house, gas leak. I mean, love includes telling a person the truth Loving them means not thinking I'm better than them. It means having affection towards them. It means having compassion towards them. It means being gladly willing to stand side by side with them in friendship, just as Jesus did. But it doesn't mean approving of what God calls sin. I cannot say to someone who is practicing this pattern of life, I approve of your decisions. I can say, I love you. I care about you. I will be your friend no matter what happens. But 
I must also say, I don't agree with you and neither does the Bible. Tenth place, the Bible is incredibly clear. The true church is made up of true Christians who are willing to obey God's word. The true church is made up of true Christians who are willing to obey God's word. We welcome people into relationship with us who practice a homosexual lifestyle. We are eager to befriend them and reach out to them as Jesus did. But we will not affirm unrepentant sin and declare it to be in right relationship with God, which is exactly what membership in the church does. See the distinction? Not looking to hide, not looking to avoid friendship, but we will draw the line where a person, not one who's struggling with temptation, but one who is willing to pursue this practice without restraint and sees nothing wrong with it. No, that must be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus before we can affirm that this person's faith is genuine. So, our church will continue to preach the truth of God's word. We will befriend and express biblical love toward anyone who is currently practicing or tempted by homosexual sin. And as part of that friendship, we will share the good news that repentance and forgiveness is available in Christ. We'll do this with love and humility. We will welcome any sinner who repents of their sin and is willing to commit to faithful obedience to Jesus, ongoing, imperfect, but faithful obedience to Jesus into the membership of this church. Here's why this is so valuable to us. We didn't make any of that up. That's not like my idea. It's like Aaron and I sat down and said, well, how are we going to handle this? Okay, let's make 10 points, policies for our church. Here's how we're going to handle it. Here's what we're going to think. No, no. All of that is incredibly clear in the Bible. And you could list a lot more things. How does a Christian relate to their government? How does a Christian relate to people in their neighborhood? I mean, there's a lot, lot of things that we don't know specifically but that we do have general principles that lead us and guide us. There's this incredible clarity in the Bible, incredible clarity that we can trust in in the midst of a changing culture. We can trust in it. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, Timothy, here's my way of life. This is going to happen to you too. Here's what you do. Trust the word. Trust the word. God is clear. God breathed out. Scripture is clear. It's authoritative, but it's clear. God is a kind father. He gives clear direction to his children, sometimes hard directions, sometimes directions we don't like, just like my children will say, I don't want to do that. Well, I understand, but this is God's clear word, and it is for your good. And aren't we grateful for Scripture that is so clear because it is precisely that clarity that leads us to the gospel? It's the clarity of Scripture that makes clear God has revealed himself in the word Jesus Christ. You can't disconnect some clarity of Scripture from another. Isn't the Bible incredibly clear that if we repent of our sins and believe in Jesus, we will be saved, we will come into right relationship with God, we will know Him forever, we have the promise of heaven. The clarity of the Bible is trustworthy, and not just trustworthy, it's good, it is good for us to trust the clarity of Scripture. Finally, third aspect of Scripture we can trust in the promises of God's word. The promises of God's word are rich and profound and needed. This is why Paul is saying to Timothy, in the midst of suffering, preach the word. It's not just about authority. It's not just about clarity. It's not just about rules we can follow. It's about incredible promises that are presented to us to describe what will take place so that it doesn't surprise us and to reassure us of God's hope that he's given us in the midst of those moments. Paul's saying to Timothy the same thing we might say, when you face these incredible difficulties, look to the map you have been given. It has everything you need and will lead you home. Promises that are present in the world. I'll just list a couple. God has given us all we need to love and follow him. 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, which of course comes through his word, who called us to his own glory and excellence. He's given us all we need. He's given us all we need. When you think about Friday and you think about the future, 
Think about it through the lenses of God's word. Everything you need to know what to do is found in here. It's right here. Just reading that chapter this morning, isn't it wonderful how it, it like pops out at you? Wow, how relevant is this scripture to our life right now? Exactly. God has given us all that we need through our knowledge of him, all the promises we need to trust him, all the words we need to obey him. A couple other promises, warnings, truth about the future in this word that's very helpful. The world will hate God and those that follow God. And some professing Christians will fall away from a faithful witness to God. That's a promise in the sense that it's going to happen. Some professing Christians will fall away from faithful witness to God. Jesus speaking in Matthew says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Another promise of God's word, the gospel's progress is unstoppable. The gospel's progress is unstoppable. If you read the book of Acts, and I would encourage you to do so, that's maybe the primary point of the book of Acts. The gospel's progress is unstoppable. It doesn't matter if there's internal division. It doesn't matter if there's internal faithlessness. It doesn't matter if there's external persecution. It doesn't matter if you're struggling with the culture. It doesn't matter if the, the emperor or the governor or, the, or whoever is against you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you don't have enough leaders. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The gospel's progress is unstoppable. The word will go forward and will not be stopped no matter what. Now, it might look a little different in the next 50 years, in the last 50 years, next 100 years, in the last 100 years. We might experience more tests of adversity than prosperity. But frankly, in the Bible, often tests of prosperity is even more difficult for the church to pass than the test of adversity. Therefore, we can have confidence that God's word will prevail. It doesn't matter what judges say. It doesn't matter what lawyers say. It doesn't matter what activists say. It's true that no one has ever been able to stop the forward progress of the gospel. The, Satan, the enemy is not able to blind the eyes of those who God intends to hear the gospel and respond. What they formerly thought of as ridiculous, ludicrous, and dangerous, they will now think of as light and glorious and appealing. The person they pre previously thought of as dangerous, they will now think of as savior. That is going to take place. It happens in every century. And frankly, we should not be afraid. Neither should we be self-confident. It is not a guarantee that persecution and difficulty will lead to a faithful church. It's possible that the love of some will fall away. So therefore, we should press in. We should press in. Because those who endure to the end will be saved. And that endurance ultimately will be sustained by the God who has never failed in keeping his promises. And the word of God will not return void, but will accomplish the purpose for which he sends it. And that purpose is the salvation of men and women of every sinful and sexual background who come into a saving relationship with God and make it to heaven preserved by his grace. So if you are afraid, look to the word of God and the promises about an unstoppable gospel. If you fear for your children and the future, remember that often, often, the test of prosperity is more devastating to faith than the test of adversity. It may be that this adversity leads some children to a true faith in Jesus Christ. If you are angry, remember that God is more angry at sin than you are. But also remember that he has forgiven your sins and now calls you to proclaim his offer of mercy. 
If you are shocked, remember that Jesus predicted that these things would take place. If you are grieved for our country, remember that we have a homeland in the heavens, unstained and unspoiled, and that God will one day bring us home. If you desire to work in the political or cultural process against the promotion of sin, do so in the grace of God and with full commendation of our church. Only keep your eyes on the ultimate king and the ultimate hope. Moral governments will come and go, but the judge of all the earth will do right. If you have friends or relatives that are homosexual or approve of a homosexual lifestyle, remember that the God of heaven is behind you to give you strength and wisdom to love and speak truth just as he would have you do. Over 70 years ago, there was an attack, many of you would know, on Pearl Harbor. It was a dreadful attack. It was a dreadful day in the life of our country, politically, militarily. Following that attack, a number of things took place, just providentially, that it wasn't as successful as the enemy thought it would be. And actually, one of the leaders in that attack was discouraged by the outcome and said that this will actually affect the opposite of what we intended. To paraphrase, he said, I fear all we have done is to waken a slumbering giant and rouse him to fury. Based on the teaching of Acts, the teaching of the entire scriptures, I know that all that happens ultimately when immorality is promoted is that God is bringing about his purposes to advance the gospel. I pray for our church that all that has happened in this church and in others in our country is to waken a slumbering church and rouse her to zeal for the gospel, love for the lost, faithfulness to the word, and trust in God. Let's pray. Father, we find our trust completely in you. You are all we need. How firm a foundation, saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Lord, we declare our trust in you as a church, our gratefulness, our broken-hearted awe at your merciful salvation. Give us grace to reach out to this culture with courage and compassion, with both courage and compassion, Lord, with grace and truth. Lord, that we would not fail in one or the other, that we would not become Pharisees or hypocrites, Lord, that we would not either become hermits, that those who turn away from this culture in lovelessness. Lord, we, we pray, Lord, for grace to be faithful to you. Give us grace. Lord, for any who are fearful, give them confidence in you. Make this moment cause us to run to your word, to explore its treasures, to absorb its promises, to see its clarity, to trust your authority through it. We thank you and we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.